Welcome to The Midpoint, conversations with the extraordinary people building the American innovation economy from the inside out. I'm Patrick McKenna, founder of One America Works. Welcome to The Midpoint. I'm Patrick McKenna, founder of One America Works and partner at uh, Comeback Capital. Today, I am joined in Cleveland by uh, Ray Leach, CEO of Jumpstart. Welcome to the program. Great. Thanks for having me. So why don't we just start with what is Jumpstart? Yeah, so Jumpstart is a relatively unique organization. We call ourselves a venture development firm. So first, the Jumpstart itself is a 501c3 nonprofit. So I'm the founder of it 20 years ago. And the vision was uh, for Jumpstart was to uh, create, uh, help strengthen or accelerate Cleveland's ability to be a, uh, a center for innovation, early stage tech startups, that kind of thing. We talk or use the term venture development because the idea was how do we create economic wealth and opportunity through venture capital, but to do it in a way that is really double, triple bottom line, benef- you know, has a benefit to the community. So the first 50 million that Jumpstart raised um, to invest in really, really early stage companies was all done as a nonprofit. So 100% of the returns of those investments would go to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem of did Northern receive, Ohio. Did they receive, like, is it, did they receive uh, equity in those investments or are they more grants? No, no, it's all equity or it was all equity. Now, Jumpstart's invested now almost 90 million over the last 18, 19 years. But the first 50 million, Jumpstart was investing anywhere from 250 to a million dollars. Uh, typically, as the very first check a early stage tech startup would receive, and in return we would get equity. So, uh, so Jumpstart's had some great exits. We've had about almost thirty exits over the course of the last uh, eighteen years, including Cover My Meds, which was the first unicorn exit in Ohio. Uh, so, uh, so again, this idea of an a uh, organization that is coaching hundreds of tech entrepreneurs a year pro bono, but then investing in in the, in the early days, maybe 10 a year. And last year, we invested in 40 companies. You know, it's funny because uh, this sounds like a great example of an overnight success that's 10 years, or in your case, 18 years in right, the in the right. making. Right. And today, we're in Cleveland, right, um, a place that you know well. You started this sure. pretty much in Northeast Ohio as this vision of transitioning manufacturing to technology. And we're also today going to be joined later by Steve Case. Right. Who joined, who started his Rise of the Rest kind of mission right. uh, here in meeting you. So uh, the 10 years of uh, this overnight success, like what has happened in this this amount of time since you started this that's changed that here so many more people are aware of Ohio and Northeast Ohio and are willing to invest? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, first of all, longevity, right? When I started Jumpstart 20 years ago, I never thought the organization would even be here uh, 20 years down the line. One of the reasons why I didn't know or necessarily believe it would be here is I didn't know that the community or in many cases, the state of Ohio and the philanthropic community of northern Ohio would be as supportive as it has been to Jumpstart and to many, many, many of our uh, nonprofit and for profit partners. So we've been able to basically build a runway, have the plane go down the runway, invest in hundreds of tech startups. And it really, I think, has been motivated by this idea of a public, private and philanthropic partnership that knows this takes generations to occur. So, you know, and if you're investing in seed stage companies, the average time to exit is eight to 10 years, right? So that's just one gestation period. So it's been a, a really special thing uh, that I'm very proud of. And, and I feel blessed that we've had this opportunity to make this happen. So Ohio has actually really innovated in the private public partnership. Sure. Can you talk about the matching fund program? Sure. That's a, actually a very unique program that I think is working really well. Yeah, yeah. So back in 2003, the state of Ohio launched a program called the Ohio Third Frontier, which basically allowed the state to put dollars out. In the early days, it was all grants. More recently, it's evolved to be more loans and grants. But the, uh, the structure of the program was such where they could lay out a vision and then different regions of the state could apply their industries or the stage of their companies because we have incredible economic diversity across the state. So they were able to lay out this overarching strategy. But the other thing that uh, that was so interesting is it requires match. So if someone's going to go to the third frontier, whether it's to start a venture fund or to have an entrepreneurial program, you've got to bring money other than the state money to execute that program or to launch that fund. So So this ability to leverage the public sector leadership 
to be a catalyst for philanthropic and private dollars to advance either a statewide economy or a statewide industry or a region has been very, very unique. Another thing that's very unique about Ohio is having attracted um, drive capital Absolutely. and having real institutional kind of networked capital based in Ohio. Can you talk about the impact of having like full cycle investor. Right. Local. Absolutely. So Drive Capital, again, has been in business about 10 years. It has been a game changer for Ohio, particularly over the last five or six years. One, because um, it has the claim to fame of being the largest venture fund in the middle part of the country, $2.2 billion under management. That's kind of on the branding side. But at the practical side, you could come to Ohio and you could actually have local investors that could take you through a 20, 30 million dollar series of fundraising that didn't exist and doesn't exist in most parts of the country. So Drive has been a real catalyst to prove that it can be done, that great companies can be built, scaled, that they can access capital. Uh, and generate great returns. They also, it's not like they created the investment opportunity. They came and capitalized on it. I know you've talked a lot about like talent and the assets that are here. Recently, you were talking about uh, annually, but there's like 500, 470,000 students. Correct, yeah. Graduated in the state of Ohio. Right. Um, can you talk about how the talent ecosystem kind of matches up around Ohio and where that opportunity leads us? Yeah, I think a big driver for drive, for drive Capital to be founded in Columbus was one, Ohio State, very large institution there, lots of great engineering students, but equally, if not more compelling, that there's more engineering graduates within a eight, nine mile drive, eight hour drive around Ohio than anywhere in the world. So there's a real concentration of technical talent. And of course, Ohio is a huge medical center uh, as well. And so two most important components, I think, for a lot of the work that we do is talent and capital. And so we're doing better and better. We have great talent. We're doing better at keeping the talent. And now we're also leveraging these partnerships to be able to aggregate more capital and invest more capital in companies uh, in Ohio and in adjacent states. The most recent, recent exciting thing has been Intel. Absolutely. And as we go up the stack, and now we're moving into uh, manufacturing advanced manufacturing, you know, future um, technologies. Can you talk a little bit about how Intel arrived here? And it's a different thing that I'm used to is kind of the software investing. Right. This is a different level of validation. Right. right. Well, I think one thing, one of the reasons why Intel landed here was that the state of Ohio built an economic development strategy focused on growth industries and created vehicles that could uh, be, that could create incentives or provide incentives to large global companies. And so one of the Along with the Ohio Third Frontier, the other incredible asset Ohio has is an organization called Jobs Ohio, which has monetized the liquor monopoly inside the state. So it used to be uh, that all the, uh, the, the taxes from spirits would go to state government. Now the revenues of the taxes that are generated from spirits sold in the state go to an independent private nonprofit called Jobs Ohio which is now generating over 300 million a year in revenue. And net net, they have over 200 million after servicing the debt and all that in terms of the creation of it, they have over about a quarter of a billion dollars a year to invest in economic development projects statewide that can be catalysts. So without, without the third frontier, you don't create the, the kind of the foundation. Without things like Jobs Ohio, you don't have the dollars to incentivize these global companies come to Ohio. So those two things together, along with the regional partnerships, it's a very powerful collaboration that I think, um, you know, we really believe the next two, two or three generations for Ohio are going to be incredibly prosperous, unlike maybe what we've experienced over the last 50 years. What makes me think of is the bumper sticker, drink a beer, support a startup. Absolutely. We definitely yeah. make that right. one. That would be great, right? Absolutely. So the Intel one, can you talk about, because it's a different, it's a different skill type, different worker than Absolutely. people usually think in tech. What are the plans for developing that level of talent, upskilling, retraining, or just greenfield um, workforce development? Yeah, so Intel has invested in huge partnerships along with Ohio State and dozens of universities and community colleges statewide uh, to be able to ensure that they are going to be able to have the workforce. I mean, they're starting building two fab labs. There's talk of them building eight. Wow. Fab Labs in Ohio over the next uh, couple decades. So Ohio convinced Intel that we have the talent, that we can upskill the talent that we need, that they will need. But then there's also 300 Intel suppliers moving to Ohio as we speak. So 
there's a huge evolution of the uh, the talent base of Ohio happening right now. What was the the reason they chose Ohio? Like, the, is what was the one or two? Like, what was the top reason they chose Ohio? They had a lot of choices. Right. Well, I think there's a handful. One is. Uh, uh, climate change. You know, the fact that Ohio was a place where there was very, very little risk uh, for issues and challenges around climate. Number one. Number two, real estate. The fact that there's thousands of acres available near urban centers like Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, and other parts of the state. So you can literally build a huge fab lab within a half hour drive of a major urban center. I think another huge element was infrastructure. I mean, the, the, uh, the initial uh, Fab Labs for Intel are going to need 85 million gallons of water every day. Mm. So Ohio obviously sits on Lake Erie, on the Great Lakes. It also has one of the largest aquifers that's untapped in the United States under the state of Ohio. So I think there's, there's a handful of these macroeconomic assets, attributes made Ohio a really compelling place to, for Intel to relocate along with the incentives and along with the belief. I mean, there's 12 million people that live in Ohio, so this isn't a small state. I and mean, we do have incredible uh, interstate infrastructure and urban and commercial infrastructure to uh, convince Intel that they can scale here. And also, this to be honest, like <clears throat> leadership, bring a composed proposition that layers in water, energy, public investments, right, right. You know, the geography, and across party lines, I'm sure, to present to Intel that this yeah. is a place that 30-year investment is going to be safe. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. I think another dimension, too, is location. So if you're in Ohio, you're approximate to 65 70% of the nation's uh, economy within a day's drive. So and location to lots and lots of big companies, big customers. So I love flipping this around. This location as an advantage versus Correct. flyover location right, right, as a disadvantage. Right. I see what Ohio's done, and it's not overnight. And I've made lots of investments in Ohio, and I see lots more investments to be made. What can other states learn from Ohio? Like, what are two or three kind of hits that you would say, can it take your Ohio hat off if you were talking to other states that have similar you know, that eight to 15 million dollar, 15 million population, right. similar kind of uh, infrastructure, similar resources, what can they do to emulate the success? I think the most important thing any state can do is to identify where the most significant areas are for leadership. In, this, in the state, what's been so interesting through Democrat, Republican, Democrat administration, so this hasn't been a partisan thing, the state has played a really catalytic role that's very unique and distinct. In other places, it might be institutions or might be corporations. But uh, what has happened in Ohio is that the state has built this leadership and encouraged others to follow and others of all different industries and geographies uh, have done so. So I think if I'm a leader in a state or in a region, I'm thinking through who are the individuals, the organizations and the institutions that have the biggest vision, the orientation to collaborate, and have the resources to catalyze new and different actions. And the, the state of Ohio, uh, I think, unlike most other places, has really served in that capacity in a meaningful way. Well, we hope a lot of other states uh, watch this, reach out, follow the Ohio playbook, because they'll really benefit from it. Thank you for joining us today. Super. Thank you. To learn more about One America Works, visit our website at oneamericaworks.org.